Hi! In this video, we're going to look at another spring mass problem, another free motion problem. So we have no external forces applied to the system once it is set in motion. All right, and so this is example two in your notes, and it asks you to use the same spring mass system from example one. That's what we looked at in the last video. And so I've written all the parameters that we had from that problem up here at the top. And then the only difference here is that we now have a damping mechanism with C equals 2 kilograms per second. And in the previous problem, we had C equals 0. So we assumed ideal motion. And what we got was just repeating oscillations with the same amplitude and same period forever. This time we have this resistive force, uh, so maybe friction, something like that, that is maybe causing the size of the oscillations to decrease. All right, so we're going to look, actually, before we solve this, at a an app I have, and I will put the link in the video description for this. Uh, this is just a Desmos app, and you can use the sliders or type your own numbers in for the M, C, and K values, and it will graph the solution to the differential equation. And then the other things you can type in, the A and the B, it tells you up in the top here, that the A is Y of 0, so that's your initial position, and the B is Y prime of 0, so your initial velocity. So I'm going to go ahead and type those numbers and then restart the video after I've typed the numbers for the problem we are working on. Okay, so I've typed in our M, C, K, and initial position and initial velocity values here, and you see the graph has changed a little bit. I'm going to zoom in the window, but I want to make one comment about that before I do. Um, this app is set up so that it will just graph the entire curve for all values of t, but really in the context of the problem, it shouldn't make sense that we really have a graph for t less than zero, because t equals zero corresponds to when the object was set in motion. So you could modify this so that the graph only shows for t greater than or equal to zero, but I'm just going to ignore that part of the graph that doesn't really make sense for t less than zero. All right, and I'm going to adjust the window so I can see the curve a little bit better for t greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so you can just adjust the window like you do normally in Desmos, so either by zooming in or out with your screen, or you can type in some constants for the minimum and maximum values for your window. Um, but what you can see here, it appears from this graph that I have an underdamped system. So we talked about that in the last video, what underdamped system means. Graphically, that means I'm going to have continuing oscillations that are going to go on forever, but with decreasing amplitude, so smaller and smaller size of oscillations. And so eventually you can't really see them anymore unless you zoom way in. Uh, and so it appears that I have some very small continuing oscillations on this system. All right, so let's go ahead and solve the differential equation, and that's what we should expect to get when we actually find the solution. Okay, so the first thing we want to do here is write down the differential equation. That's pretty straightforward. We're just going to use the model m y double prime plus c y prime plus k y equals zero that we discussed in the last video. Uh, so I'm just going to put my m, c, and k values that we were given in place there. And then I also have my initial position that was given, 0 0.05 meters, and initial velocity. Those were given in that last video. All right, so that's the first thing it asked me to do, write an initial value problem. And then now it asks us to solve it. So these are the ones that we solved using a characteristic polynomial. So at this point, that shouldn't be too difficult for you. I'm going to go ahead and write that kind of quickly here just to save a little bit of time. Okay, so here I've got my r values, and this, based on the graph that we looked at, is really what I was expecting here. So a negative real part, that's going to give me that e to the negative 5t part of my solutions. That will control the amplitude of the oscillations, and the cosine of 2 square root of 55t and a sine of 2 square root of 55t. That will cause the actual oscillations, and the e to the negative 5t that's times those 
will cause the amplitude of those oscillations to decrease as t gets larger. All right, sometimes I have students who decide to get decimal approximations. If the homework problem actually asks you for decimal approximations, you probably want to do that at the end so that you don't end up with compound round off error as you do your other calculations. So that would be my suggestion. Uh, just wait till the end and then convert things to decimals if you want to do that. That's my general solution. I do have initial values, so we're going to go ahead and use them to find the C1 and C2. Again, this part of the problem we've done before, so this isn't hard. I'm going to go quickly through this part. Okay, so there is our solution that you can see from the exponential decay function that is controlling the amplitude on the cosine and sine functions that we have oscillations with decreasing amplitude. Uh, also, you could tell what the period of those oscillations is since both of these two trig functions have this 2 times squared 55 inside the trig function times the t. Uh, we can just take 2 pi over that number to find the period of the oscillations. And of course, you can simplify that. Um, so depending on what you want to do, maybe you could go ahead and stop here and just leave your answer in this exact form and describe some things about this system. Uh, occasionally on the My Math Lab homework, they do ask you to use that identity that I talked about in the last video to rewrite this. So I'm going to go ahead and do that for this problem, unless you're specifically told to do that. Or unless there's some specific information you need from that form, I don't care whether you choose to do that step or not on any assignments that I've written. For the trig function, sometimes you have to be a little bit careful to think about what quadrant the angle would be in if A or B is negative. For this problem, since our A and our B value are both positive, the phi will be in quadrant 1. So I can use either the cosine or the sine and I'll get an angle in quadrant 1. Occasionally, if you have negative A or B or both values, you might have to think a little bit harder about the trig that's involved to find the correct value for that angle phi. All right, so I now have my solution in a simpler form. I am going to just factor out, uh, I didn't write that step out, but I thought about it as factoring out the e to the negative 5t so that I could just work with the numbers for the coefficients for the cosine and sine terms. So I'll have my e to the negative 5t times c out front. All right, and so there is my answer kind of rewritten as a single trig function with that decreasing amplitude out front caused by that exponential decay function. And uh, sometimes in the My Math Lab homework, they ask you for decimal approximations. So this would be the time to do that. I'm going to go ahead and write that down here. When you find the angle phi, you want to use radian mode on your calculator to do that inverse trig calculation. I don't care on homework whether you use those identities or not unless you need them to answer some questions about amplitude or phase angle or things like that. Um, so it's fine with me if you give your answers as written up here. But there are a few in the My Math Lab homework that specifically ask you to write your answer in a specific form. So just practice using that identity. It's occasionally useful. And if you take physics, you'll probably use it for other things as well. All right, try some homework.